The reason I'm here is because for the past 12 years, I've been privileged enough to do work with the exiled people of Diego Garcia, a people whose story is sadly all too similar to that of many peoples in the Pacific. Uh, last month, May, was actually the 40th anniversary of the final expulsion of the Chagosians from their homeland uh, in the Indian Ocean on the island of Diego Garcia. The Chagosians were exiled from their homeland by the U.S. and British governments as part of the construction of the U major U.S. military base on Diego Garcia, um, a base that most recently has played key roles in launching the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't pretend to speak for the Chagosians, but I do want to pass along their greetings to the organizers and to everyone in the audience. They asked me to send along this message. Please continue to support the cause of the Chagosian community in any way you can. Please join us in our campaign, and thank you for all your support for the Chagosians' cause. Uh, you can look for them at Chagos Refugees Group online. Just Google Chagos Ref Refugees Group or the UK Chagos Support Association. I have more information if you'd like it. Now, let me pivot rhetorically. <laughs> Someone had to use the stupid pun. Um, to what I'd like to share this evening. Um, what I'd like to do is hopefully provide a brief overview that adds a little bit to what Kyle did so artfully about the Asia pivot or the Pacific pivot and its history. I want to do it in the context of the massive network of 1,000 military bases the United States maintains outside U.S. boundaries, that is, on other people's lands. I want to point especially to what I see as some of the dangers of the Asia pivot concerns that I'm guessing many of you share, um, beginning with the danger that the Asia pivot has to create new Cold Wars between the U.S., China, and Russia. Before I conclude, I want to end um, with some hopefully optimistic thoughts about the work we have to do together to create the more peaceful, just, and equitable world that we know is not just possible, but absolutely necessary. Now, I want to, as Kyle did already, point out that there's nothing particularly new about the Asia pivot, or the Pacific pivot, and it doesn't begin with President Obama. We can really think of the Asia pivot as Asia pivot 2.0. Um, the most recent version of the pivot begins around the year 2000, but as Kyle showed us, the United States has been pivoting toward the Pacific since the 19th century, um, and even more, perhaps, since World War II. So that probably makes this Asia Pivot 3 or 4 or 5.0. <laughs> but beginning at the end of the Clinton administration, the start of the George W. Bush administration, the U.S. military began shifting bases, troops, and weaponry south and west, so, excuse me, south and east from Western Europe. Shortly after the invasion of Iraq, the military began shrinking the number of U.S. bases in Europe and to a lesser extent in Asia. Consolidating, consolidating U.S. forces at a reduced number of very large bases, sometimes called Burger King bases, for their Whopper size and amenity-rich suburban lifestyle. At the same time, we also see an expansion in the number and geographic spread of relatively small bases, what are often called lily pad bases, a subject that I'll return to shortly. Um, it's also important to remember that we've also seen billions literally billions and billions in new base construction in the per Persian Gulf and Central Asia connected to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's an, on top of these changes that took place mostly over the first eight years of the 21st century that we get to the Asia Pivot 2.0, now being wrongly attributed to Obama. Here's a, base, a, a brief overview of what it looks like. Um, I'll go through it quickly again because Kyle covered a lot of it. Um, in South Korea, we see the ongoing consolidation of U.S. troops at a smaller number of increasingly large bases away from the DMZ and south of Seoul, in tandem with the South Korean military's creation of the new Navy base on Jeju Island, which we'll hear about later. In Japan, we see the long-standing and little-changing dance over the removal of the much-reviled Futenma base in Okinawa. Most recently, as we heard from Julian and, and others, um, the U.S. military has, has announced it'll proceed with the relocation of Marines, um, but they're going to proceed with the relocation, allegedly, um, with less than the originally announced 8,000 Marines that were scheduled to go to Guam, um, and instead somewhere around 4,500 
Some of these forces, the forces that won't go to Guam, will go to Hawaii, to a new base present in, presence that's already established in Darwin, Australia, and perhaps in the future to other bases um, in the, Australia's Cocos Islands, um, perhaps also in Brisbane and Perth, although one never knows, as Julian pointed out, things are always sort of changing shape. Um, along with a growing naval presence in Singapore, and perhaps some presence already in Thailand and even Vietnam, there's the open and disturbing question about the return of troops to the Philippines, where, of course, as Kyle pointed out, we can't forget there's already been some hundred or more special operations troops in Mindanao at a base inside a Filipino base <laughs> since shortly after February 2002. Elsewhere in Asia, the Pentagon has rebuilt a runway on Tinian Island in the Commonwealth of the Mariana Islands, excuse me, in the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas, and is considering future bases in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei, while pushing stronger military ties with India. Every year in the region, it's also important to remember, the military conducts about 170 military exercises and 250 port visits as well as so-called humanitarian operations that clearly have aims other than those humanitarian. Major part of the Asia pivot in the entire US military's entire global strategy has been the proliferation of a new generation of relatively small bases, sometimes called cooperative security locations, and more colloquially called lily pads. As in a frog jumping across a pond toward its prey. Around the world, from Singapore to the Cocos Islands, to the jungles of Honduras, and the deserts of Mauritania, the Pentagon has been pursuing as many lily pads as it can, as, in as many countries as it can, as fast as it can. Such lily pad bases have become a critical part of an evolving US military strategy for the 21st century, aimed at maintaining, at least trying to maintain, US global dominance in an era when US geopolitical domination is being challenged for the first time in the post-Cold War era. As one former US officer explains, avoidance of, of local populations, negative publicity, and potential opposition like we've seen in Okinawa and Jeju and Guam is the new aim for this lily pad strategy. This means li lily pads are often in isolated locations, frequently secretive, and sometimes hidden within a local host nation base. Generally, lily pads have Spartan accommodations and amenities for a small number of US troops who sometimes are private military contractors. Often, lily pads are used to stockpile weapons, materiel, and supplies, all of which could be readied for the arrival of much larger numbers of US troops or mobilized to quickly deploy US military power most anywhere in the world, complement to some of what the weapon systems that Kyle described. Lily pads can take on other forms as well. Again, the, the base in Mindanao that we saw, um, which, where the Pentagon and host nations insist that a base is not a quote unquote US base, but that clearly are functionally US bases, often with, again within host nation bases, or bases like Jeju that are controlled by host nations, but allowing US forces access and the integration of other militaries fully into US military strategy. So I think we have to think about all these as as kinds of lily pads. I won't have time to talk about the story of the people of Diego Garcia, but again, I'd be happy to talk with anyone about it. Um, but I think it demonstrates well some of the dangers with the lily pad strategy, um, which let me just overview very quickly um, in the next two minutes. Um, first, lily pads, as the case of Diego Garcia shows, um, can initially sound good, a small, small base, much better than a huge base in Okinawa, um, lily pads can easily grow and to become multi-billion dollar bases like the base on Diego Garcia, which was originally pitched as an austere communications facility. Not so austere today. Um, second, um, it's also a reminder that in the short and the long term, lily pads represent increased military spending and the diversion of funds from critical human needs. Third, bases large and small exhibit a well-documented pattern of damaging local communities. The Chagosians case is just one many other cases in the, in the Pacific. Um, and for that matter, lily pads, of course, are equally likely to generate opposition, anger, and anti-American sentiment as large bases have so frequently done. 
But let me skip to the one that I want to focus on most dangerously. Um, I think lily pads are likely to increase regional military tensions and regional militarization and discourage the search for diplomatic solutions to conflicts, which are so badly needed, especially in East Asia. How would the United States respond, of course, if China or Russia or Iran were to build even a single lily pad base in Mexico or the Caribbean, most likely by boosting military spending and perhaps by building new bases? So lily pads run the risk of fueling an ever-escalating cycle of military spending, militarization, and base races, as actually Diego Garcia did in the 1970s. Um, and I see this as a, as a real threat, not just for the creation of lily pad bases, but for the entire uh, Asia pivot, the buildup of U.S. forces. How would, again, the United States respond if China were to decide to build up its military forces anywhere near this continent? To end on an optimistic note, <laughs> very quickly, um, I think we have to focus and pay attention to a, a group of increasingly prominent voices across an unusually broad and bipartisan political spectrum calling for reducing U U.S. military bases and troops overseas to produce si significant cost savings. Um, even members of the U.S. military are, are realizing that um, that we've got to close bases to save money. And while this might seem an unusual group of bedfellows and an uncomfortable group of allies, um, I think it's an all too rare moment when Pentagon spending is being cut and we have to take advantage of this opportunity um, to demand the closure of bases, shifting military spending to human needs, the rollback of the Asia pivot that's been underway for decades, centuries, and I suspect many of you would agree, we need to demand that our leaders listen to base opponents in places like Jeju, Guam, Okinawa, Diego Garcia, that they begin closing overseas bases and find productive forms of peaceful international dispute resolution and cooperation. Thank you.